Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to Too Many Games. Today we're going to continue in our video series of Epic Armageddon and look at finishing off exploring assaults uh, in this second part of our assault video uh, section. If you're interested in Epic Armageddon, then I suggest you check out the other videos that I've released so far going over the rules and, uh, and how to play Epic Armageddon. So let's get stuck in today. Okay, let's go, uh, go back and have a look at our assault procedure just to, to recall what we've had a look at. And, um, and what we've done. So hopefully you recall these from the last video that we do have seven steps to go through in an assault and we dealt with the first three in our last video. So today we're gonna to look at how to resolve our attacks in step four uh, and beyond to, to destroy the enemy and then seeing uh, what happens when you uh, see the resolution of the assault and the loser and the winner are determined. So let's have a look at step four now, resolve attacks. All units in EPIC have two assault values on their data sheet. They, uh, these are the close combat and the firefight values. Close combat or CC is used when you are in base contact with an enemy in, uh, in uh, an assault. Firefight or FF on the data sheet is the value that is used when the unit is in assault, but it's not in base to base contact, but still within that 15 centimeter range. If a unit only has close combat weapons on a starter sheet, then it has to be in base-to-base -base contact in order to attack. Uh, any unit with uh, small arms listed on their data sheet um, or another ranged weapon may attack enemies that are up to 15 centimeters away in an assault. If a unit has both, uh, then it can do either. So how do we actually attack in the assault phase then? Well, you roll 1d6 for each unit that is able to attack in the assault phase with either its close combat or its firefight value. One thing to note here is that any suppression a formation might have is ignored while fighting in the assault. In order to determine the success of the unit's attack, you compare the result of the die to the close combat value of the unit if it's in base-to-base -base contact with the enemy, or you compare the result of the die to the firefight value of the unit if it's within 15 centimeters of the enemy but not in base to base contact. And it's important to note here that these values of close combat and firefight are never modified in assault. So no modifiers are ever going to apply to that. If the die result is equal to or greater than the relevant close combat or firefight value, then a hit is scored. Okay, so now we've determined who has attacked and, and what hits were successful. Um, you now have to allocate these hits to the units that are involved in the assault. And you do this in the same way that you would for shooting. So this means from front to back, closest targets taking those hits first. However, uh, hits can only be allocated to units that are directly involved in the assault. And this means that they must be an attacker or in a defender and within 15 centimeters of the attacker slash defender after the charge moves and counter charge moves have been made. So you have to be within that zone in order to be a legal target to be allocated a hit. During an assault, it's important to note and remember that infantry that are making a charge cannot claim the bonus of a cover save um, in this encounter, but the defending units are able to use cover saves. So not the uh, negative one to hit, but cover saves. Okay, so we've allocated hits and taken saves just like we saw in shooting. And then we come to working out if there's a clear winner um, immediately. And in, in order to do that, um, we have a look to check if all the defenders are killed first. So if at least one attacker lives, uh, then the attacker wins and we skip straight to, to six, step six if all the defenders are dead and the loser at that point uh, will withdraw. So basically, the attackers just butcher the defenders in this case, and they win straight away. However, um, if all the directly engaged attackers are killed instead, then the assault has stalled, and the defenders win. So it's, um, at that point, you also skip straight to step six, and the loser would withdraw as well. Um, but what does directly engaged mean in this case? It refers to being within 15 centimeters of a defender after all charge moves and counter charge moves have been made. So basically people that are in the fight and able to attack and be allocated hits are gonna be directly engaged as far as the attackers are concerned. 
So if neither of these are true, so if one attacker is alive, then both, um, both sides at this point will call on support um, and they will try and sway the fight in their favor by having supporting fire from other units come into the assault. Okay, so let's keep moving on. We come to some important notes to keep in mind during an assault. Firstly, kills inflicted in an assault do not place blast markers or break units until after the results have been worked out. So don't accidentally place them down during the fight like you would do for shooting. Just wait till the end and they'll all get sorted out. Secondly, the attacker must kill all defenders to win at this stage of the fight, not just those directly engaged. So all defenders have to die for the attackers to win immediately before support is called for or supporting fire. And thirdly, the defender just has to kill all attackers that are directly engaged. Um, so they've got a bit of an easier time. Only directly engaged attackers have to be killed. So there can be 20 units still in that attacking formation, but it doesn't matter. If they aren't directly engaged, they don't count for this. Only directly engaged attackers uh, matter for the defender trying to stall the attack and just win it straight away. So let's take a brief minute to talk about another design concept that exists in Epic Armageddon. And this time it's on assault weapons and small arms. And you, you will see these appear on the data sheets um, that the units have as you explore Epic more and more and have a, get more familiar with your, uh, your units in your army. Assault weapons refer to close combat weapons such as choppers, chainsaws, power weapons. These are weapons that can only be used um, in assault and can only be used in base-to-base -base contact. So when you see a unit having a close combat weapon, generally you don't have to do anything um, about that because the bonus for having that weapon has already been calculated and built into their CC value on their data sheet, their close combat value. Small arms, on the other hand, refers to weapons like bolt guns and las guns, things like that. These weapons too can only be used in assault, but unlike assault, uh, assault weapons, sorry, they can be used when the unit is not in base-to-base -base contact. Just like assault weapons, you don't have to do anything special if you see that they have small arms in a unit, as those bonuses too have already been included in their firefight value. A special note, however, on small arms, is that uh, small arms are ranged weapons technically and have a range of 15 centimeters listed on their data sheet, but they are still only ever used in assault. They never use like a standard ranged weapon to perform a shooting action. Okay, let's get stuck into some FAQs for today. Do cover to hit modifiers apply in assault? Um, no, as I already hinted at, nice and simple, but you never apply the minus one to hit modifier for cover in assault. So remember we said no modifiers apply to those uh, to hit rolls. Can a, a hit be allocated to a unit that does not have line of fire to an enemy unit? No, these hits are allocated in the same manner as shooting. They require line of fire. So remember that shooting and assault allocate hits in the same way. So keep all the same principles in mind when allocating those hits. If someone is out of line of fire, then they are essentially out of the fight as far as being allocated a hit. Okay, next question. How are attacks with special abilities like ignore cover and lance allocated in an assault? And the answer is this was never covered in the rules. The unofficial consensus is that they should be allocated in such a way to utilize their special rules if possible. That is, ignore cover hits should be allocated to units that are benefiting from a cover save and lance hits should be allocated to units with reinforced armor. This is something you should bring up with your opponent in the five minute warm up. So it's a bit of an interesting one here, something uh, not covered by the rules, but generally um, try and allocate hits in a way that utilizes the benefits of their special rules. So don't apply lance hits to units with no armor saves um, if there's a good option to take uh, instead of that or don't imply ignore cover hits to, to units that aren't in cover if some are in cover So just talk about this with your opponent before the game particularly if you notice in your army list that you have a lot of special um, special rules on assault weapons and small arms So a, a few more uh, quick fire FAQs Can a cover save be used in an assault and the answer is the defender can use them, but not the attacker so take into account the cover benefits of saving throws just for that defender. Can the crossfire bonus be used in an assault? Uh, no, pretty simple there. No crossfire in an assault. 
Does an attacking unit need to have line of fire to a unit in the target formation in order to be considered directly engaged? So do you need that line of fire to be directly engaged? And the answer is yes. So if a unit's behind a wall or a building and cannot draw a line of fire, then it isn't considered directly engaged. And remember that matters when the defender kills every attacking unit that is directly engaged and, and they just kind of win the fight at that initial point. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens after the first round of attacks when no clear winner has been determined. And so we come to supporting fire. So unless the attacker has won or the attack has stalled, both sides may now call on support. So other formations not in the assault, but that are within 15 centimeters of a directly involved enemy unit may attack. Directly involved, and again, we're getting a lot of these terms here, but this will become intuitive for you. Directly involved simply means that a unit belongs to either the attackers or the defending formations. However, not all units can lend support to the fight. Broken units and also units that have marched already this turn cannot lend supporting fire to the assault. So how does it work? Units providing supporting fire roll to hit using their firefight values and they allocate any hits they score and then you make the armor saves as you would normally just like you would for a regular ranged attack. So it's an extension of the assault. Um, you use that firefight value to essentially just shoot into that assault. Don't use any other weapons however, just the firefight value of those supporting units. You remove casualties as you normally do and this will help in the resolution as we're about to see. So uh, we do have some FAQs arising from the supporting fire section as you, you probably are expecting by now when we go through these, uh, these Epic Armageddon rules. Is supporting fire affected by suppression? The answer is no. So everyone able to meet that criteria to uh, fire and support can do so. Next up, what does directly involved mean here? And the answer is, in order to support with their firefight, a unit must have a line of fire to at least one enemy unit that attacked with its close combat or firefight during the assault. Okay, so the criteria um, is explored a little more uh, in this question, and it is a little tricky. To count as directly involved, as we talked about just a, a minute ago, um, there are some stipulations. The rules uh, said that it was just units belonging to the attackers or the defending formations. However, it also means that a supporting unit must have line of fire to at least one unit that performed an attack with close combat or, or firefight value during the assault, doesn't matter which. So if an attacker or defender is spread out wide, then some supporting units might technically have range and line of fire to some of the models in the assault, but they may not technically be directly involved in the assault if they didn't perform an attack, in which case you couldn't support fire into those units. So you have to have that range and line of fire um, to someone who made an attack in order to provide supporting fire. A little tricky, but it will uh, make more sense with a bit of practice. All right, some more FAQs. Can hits from supporting fire carry over onto units that weren't directly involved? So if they weren't directly involved, can they take a hit? And the answer is no. So keep the hits generated by supporting units to the units directly involved. And remember, you apply hits um, like shooting. So if you score more hits than units available uh, to be hit, you just double up on the wounds on the units after everyone's received their first hit. How is directly involved evaluated in assaults that go on for multiple rounds? Check and re-evaluate at the end of every round. In a three round assault, a unit can go from directly involved to not, and back again with counter charges and units being removed. So the idea of being directly involved is checked. Uh, at the end of each assault round, um, if it happens to keep going, and it's just kind of that evolving um, kind of situation. All right, so after we've uh, resolved all our attacks, both attacker and defender, and then the supporters have also fired in with that supporting fire, we move on to step five, which is working out the results. And this is where we determine who will be the winner of the fight. If one side completely wipes out the other side, then it counts as winning automatically, regardless of how many units it may have lost, etc. but um, it counts as winning automatically. But if that isn't the case, and most of the time it isn't, uh, then you will follow uh, these steps. So first, both players 
will roll 2d6. They then select the highest roll on their 2d6, so whichever one is highest. They then add any modifiers that apply to that d6 to get a total result, and we'll look at these in a minute. Um, after these modifiers are added, they compare the results and the player with the highest score wins the assault. The loser of the roll-off is the loser of the assault, and as a result, they will end up suffering additional hits or, or extra hits um, to the units that they have now, and that is equal to the difference in the total scores of the dice rolled after modifiers were added. Um, so you suffer extra hits equal to that difference between the two total scores. And these hits are allocated just like they would uh, be for an assault, that is to say the closest models first, so base-to-base -base contact, and then other enemy units that are in the assault. And importantly, with these hits, there are no saves or cover saves that are allowed to be taken against them at all. So they're very, uh, very good at thinning out the enemy um, if they lose. Okay, so let's have a look at these modifiers for this dice roll because this seems pretty important and this is where you'll be uh, trying to increase these modifiers to help you out uh, and maximize your score. So let's have a look here. So you can see on this table, and it's quite handy to have this um, available or printed out during assault so you can refer to it quickly, at least until you get the hang of it. Um, also note that uh, all these modifiers are cumulative, meaning that you add them up um, all on top of each other. So firstly, uh, if you, uh, you get a plus one modifier to your dice roll for every unit that uh, you kill um, in your enemy's uh, assaulting formation, or sorry, during the assault, so a plus one modifier. So 10 kills in the assault will give you a plus 10 to your dice roll, which is pretty good. Next up, you get a plus one modifier to your dice if you outnumber the opponent. And importantly, this is checked after the resolution of the round of the assault and your casualties are removed. Uh, also, this is just compared between the attacking formations and the defending formations. Uh, any formation that landed uh, supporting fire doesn't get to count. It's just between the attackers and the defenders. Uh, you also get an additional plus one if you not only outnumbered your opponent, but you have at least double the number of units left when compared to them. So that would be a plus two in that case for outnumbering and for doubling the number of units left. Next up, you get a plus one for having no blast markers on your formation. So remember, we haven't added any blast markers during the assault at this point. So these blast markers are what was on the formations before the assault actually happened. And then furthermore, you get another plus one modifier if the opponent has more blast markers than you do. Uh, in the case that you both have no blast markers, both sides will get a plus one for having none, but obviously wouldn't count for the other side having more than them in that case. So as you can see here, there are a few modifiers, but a helpful way I like to remember is to remember three things. How much did you kill? Do you outnumber them? And what about your blast markers? And you'll find that you uh, remember the details of how all that works rather quickly. Uh, once you've played a few games, they'll, they'll come to mind real quick. So a few more points on working out the combat as well. What happens uh, when a tie occurs after the dice roll and the modifiers are added to that, that dice, that highest dice? Well, in this case, uh, this is where we repeat the round of combat and, combat and fight for a second time. So starting from step four, which is resolve attacks. So you essentially get to have another go at trying to kill each other uh, in combat, which is always fun. But before resolving those attacks, both sides are able to make a free counter charge move with their units in the assault. And the attacker goes first in this counter charge and um, all the normal rules f apply for a counter charge that we've already seen uh, in our previous video. However, one thing to note uh, when doing this, when you work out the results for a second round of combat, the casualties that are inflicted in the first round of combat still count towards the total when determining the modifier to your dice roll. So if you kill five units in the first round, then you have a tie and have to fight a second round and you kill three more units in that second round, your modifier for units killed in that second round of combat would be plus eight. That is five units from the first and three from the second, eight in total, not the plus three that you might think just from that second round of combat. So those casualties carry over from round to round. Okay, FAQ time once again. So let's have a look at our first one. 
are the extra hits the losing formation suffers only applied to units who are directly involved? And the answer is no. They are applied to any units in the losing formation. So when a formation loses, it suffers hits regardless of how many units actually made it into a directly uh, involved situation and how many actually fought. And remember, if multiple formations are involved, they count as a single formation. So the damage may be allocated over several formations depending on the position uh, for allocating that damage. Okay, next up, do the extra hits the losing formation suffers require line of fire? Good question, and the answer is no. So it doesn't matter if you can see them anymore or not, or where things have ended at the end of that, that assault, they just take those hits regardless. Can the extra hits the losing formation suffers be allocated to units being transported in a fearless transport? And the answer is yes. So again, we haven't looked at fearless yet, um, as it's a special rule and we will get there eventually, but basically fearless units don't take damage from these hits as part of a special rule. But you can apply them and you have to apply them to the units that the fearless transports may be carrying. Again, not a, uh, a common one for most people, but it can happen with the right transport. Okay, let's have a look at another question. Uh, it's a big one this time. How are the extra hits the losing formation suffers allocated to a formation with units being uh, transported? Once one of these hits is allocated to a transport or it is skipped over because it is fearless, all units it is transporting must be allocated a hit while any remain before moving on to the next closest unit. Any remaining units that were being transported, either fearless units or those that weren't allocated a hit, would then make their normal armor save or a cover save of six plus if the transport was destroyed. The formation would not receive a blast marker for any of these saves if they failed. So it starts getting a bit complex with units and transports, but just follow it as it says when working it out. Start by allocating a hit to the transport um, as it would be the closest one. And then the, the next hits go on the units inside the transport and continue on. Uh, when you've run out of hits from these extra hits, any units within a transport that took a hit and that unit um, itself didn't take a hit and have to bail out because the transport was destroyed, have to try and save for, um, for getting out of a transport that's destroyed. So they roll their armor save or a six plus cover save um, because that transport was destroyed. These units might be fearless or they just didn't have enough hits to target them, it kind of says, but essentially hit the transport first and then the guys inside with the hits if you've got enough hits to distribute. Uh, again, it's a little bit tricky, but um, yeah, you'll be able to work it out as you kind of step through um, the results and, and how to apply those extra hits that come at the end of the assault phase. Okay, we're getting through these FAQs. Are units lost due to overwatch fire on the attacking formation counted when working out the result? The answer is no. So overwatch happens before the assault, so they don't count. Uh, they can break a unit before the assault, mind you. Refer back to Overwatch for what happens when you break in your own activation. Um, are units lost due to failed dangerous terrain tests counted for working out the results? And no, they are not kills you have inflicted. So a similar kind of thing um, that happens before the assault. And so again, um, oh sorry, dangerous terrain tests might happen during it um, if it's a counter charge, but don't, um, yeah, don't, count them into the totals. They won't affect those totals because they're not actually kills. They're just dangerous terrain casualties. Okay, so let's move on to what happens after you've worked out the results and you have a clear winner. Um, so after that winner's decided and you've applied those extra hits to the loser, uh, the loser or the losing formation is broken and must withdraw. If the loser was already broken before the assault began, they will just be destroyed instead of breaking for a second time. So if they're already broken, they're just simply destroyed completely. The broken unit now must make a withdrawal move. Um, and we're going to have a look at what withdrawal moves, um, how to do them in our next video. Um, so I won't go too much into that. Along with this, obviously units breaking uh, have an effect on nearby units. Um, and the morale of those units. So any formations that were on the losing side that were with, uh, within supporting fire range, so that's 15 centimeters of the enemy, um, directly engaged, 
not directly involved, sorry, suffer a single blast marker as well. Even if these units didn't provide any supporting fire, they still suffer a blast marker. So just think of that as kind of a demoralization from seeing the, uh, the, the allies that you have uh, retreating or being destroyed. Uh, this one can be an easy one to overlook, so make sure you measure this out before you start um, cleaning up from the assault, just to make sure you've got it all right. So once the loser has been broken and they've withdrawn, um, you now go back to the winning formation and apply extra blast markers that are needed for any casualties that they suffered during the assault. So like shooting, uh, one blast marker per casualty suffered um, during the assault that you just fought. It is possible at this time after working out who won for the winner to now break as well. Uh, but if this happens, the winner does not have to make a withdrawal move if they choose not to. Um, even if enemies are within 15 centimeters of them and that will make some more sense once we look at the withdrawal moves in our next video But essentially they're not forced to move from where they are. They can stay where they are um, They've just won a combat. So, you know, they're feeling pretty good If they were broken before combat then they were assaulted, but they won the combat They receive no additional blast markers and they still remain broken um, so that will make sense again after we've looked at our next video because additional blast markers would cause additional casualties But they do not suffer them if they win uh, So after your opponent has withdrawn any units remaining on the winning side are free to make a five centimeter Consolidation move now and this will help you tidy up your formation Maybe make use of cover or just move into a into a better position They may not enter a zone of control of an enemy with this five centimeter consolidation move though. So unlike some other games that you may have played, you can't consolidate your unit at the end of a combat into another an assault, uh, into another enemy to assault it, or you can't start a new assault or anything like that. You just get a free five centimeter move at the end if you choose to, but stay out of enemy zones of control. Now, once again, we do have some FAQs arising from this. Can a transport unit pick up another unit as part of its consolidation move? What if the unit being picked up disembarked at the end of the charge move? And the answer is yes and yes, but the unit being picked up may not make a consolidation move when this happens. This is one that I looked over myself personally in a recent game. So it's good to always uh, remember these things and remind yourself of them. So there is a great flexibility for units with transports, particularly fast moving transports um, with units in them that like assaulting. Your consolidation move can pick up units just like a regular move. Just make sure that the unit being picked up doesn't move itself before being picked up, just like you would in a regular move. Um, and it's great for getting your transports ready for their next activation maybe. Maybe they're gonna do another armored assault um, in the next turn. So it's a great option to have there. Okay, let's have a look at another question. Do I have to use a consolidation move to move out of an enemy zone of control? And the answer is no, a consolidation move isn't mandatory. Uh, it just can't be used to enter another enemy unit zone of control. Note that this can create a situa situation where a fearless unit does not withdraw and units from the winning side remain in base contact with it. When this happens, the opposing formation will automatically be drawn into an assault on either formation. <clears throat> so your consolidation move is entirely optional and you don't have to make it. You can stay inside a zone of control of an enemy. Uh, so again, fearless makes this a bit tricky and I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not actually 100% sure how this works from the reading, so maybe if you're a guru on that one, leave a note in the comments, but a fearless unit doesn't withdraw despite losing, or doesn't have to withdraw despite losing, and if you're in base contact with it, um, you don't have to consolidate out from it. You're drawn into an assault with the fearless unit again. Um, the one unclear part is when this happens. Is it straight away or not? Um, I would assume it's straight away, as it says nothing about in your next activation, but um, I'm not 100% on that. I've never had this come up. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it would be something to navigate carefully with your opponent if it does come up. And my opinion would be that that um, combat that you're automatically drawn into, that assault, would happen uh, straight away. Okay, so let's have a look at what, ha what happens when you're assaulting units that are either really close together or are mixed in together. We, we call this intermingled formations. So when you declare a charge as part of your engage action, you can include additional enemy formations as the target as long uh, as with your original target, um, sorry, along with your original target, 
if they count as being intermingled. And what does it mean for them to be intermingled? Well, if two formations have units that are within five centimeters of each other, then they count as being intermingled. So inside of each other's zone of control, essentially. Uh, you'll find this happens quite a bit with units, particularly if they're trying to provide support or covering fire for each other. Um, however, as the attacker, you don't actually have to include any additional formations as a target, even if they're intermingled. You're under no obligation, and you have to weigh out what will aid your cause more, having them in the combat and maybe getting them into base contact potentially, or would you prefer to leave them in a position where maybe they can provide supporting fire if that happens in the assault. Um, if you choose to have them um, as a target as well as the original, then the intermingled, intermingled formations count as a single formation for the purposes of the assault. So a bit more on intermingled formations. All intermingled formations can make counter charges. So you have to consider that when you target multiple units. And when it comes to allocating hits in the assault, you allocate them to any units in the assault, regardless of which formation they belong to. Obviously following the standard rules for allocating hits, uh, starting with the closest units, etc. When it comes to working out the results um, of the assault, when determining how many blast markers you have on your formation, you total up all the blast markers for the formations that are involved on one side. If the intermingled formations lose the assault, then they all break at the same time. So obviously this is a benefit. Um, if you think you can defeat more than one unit in the uh, formation in the assault, as the attacker, it might be a good thing to do. However, if the uh, defending intermingled formations win the assault, then you add blast markers to each formation for the casualties they sustain during the assault, and you check for breaking as you normally would as the victor of the assault. And all formations get to make the consolidation move. So that's probably all you need to know about uh, intermingled formations, but it's just a way that as an attacker, you can assault more than one formation provided they're close enough. And you basically treat them as a single formation for the fight. Except we wouldn't be done without a couple of FAQs now, would we? So let's have a look again. If a formation is intermingled with a broken formation, can the extra hits from losing the assault be taken on the broken formation? Yes, so long as those units are closer to the attacking formation, units are removed for those extra hits and then the broken formations are destroyed. So a very fringe case once again, but it can happen. If one of the units is broken um, that you assaulted and they're intermingled, then apply the additional hits from assault as normal, um, like you would for any wound allocation, closest units taking hits first. Um, after you've done all of those additional hits, this is when you've won the combat, obviously, uh, then you remove the broken units completely from the game as the rules state, because broken units, if they lose, are destroyed. So you could soak up a few hits really in this. If the formation um, is broken and they take the additional hits themselves and then they're destroyed anyway, you've kind of saved a few, um, a few models from dying potentially. Okay, last couple of questions, then we have finished our video on assaults. Does the charging formation need to get within 15 centimeters of all intermingled formations? No. So an interesting one here, as we'll see uh, with our next question too, you can declare intermingled units as targets, but you actually don't need to end within 15 centimeters of the intermingled formations for the assault, and it still counts and goes ahead. It becomes very interesting when fighting against some big formations too, like some massive orc hordes. Um, you know, you still have to judge if it's gonna be worth doing that, but you don't need to end within 15 centimeters of those additional intermingled formations. Does the charging formation need to get within 15 centimeters of the original target? Or can it get within 15 centimeters of any intermingled formation? So this is the reverse. And the answer, <clears throat> talk about it with your opponent during the five minute uh, warm up. It's played both ways around the world. And to finish up our video on assaults, we have a rather unclear, unsatisfying answer. If you target multiple units that are intermingled, do you have to get within 15 centimeters of the uh, original target? Well, maybe. Um, so just remember that you, you do have an orig uh, original target and then um, from there it stands that other intermingled formations become 
targets as well. So you'd have to check with your opponent on this one to what they think. I personally would play it as yes, you have to be able to engage that original target. Um, otherwise, it could start getting very wonky if you don't have to. But just remember, it, um, it might be avoided by simply flipping your original target over to the other formation that you can get in range of and having uh, the first target that you decided to become the intermingled uh, formation, the additional target. It could work like that too. But again, um, talk about it with your opponent um, during that warm up or if it comes up, but I would personally lead to needing to get within 15 centimeters of the original target myself. Well, we made it once again to the end of another video in our Epic Armageddon series. Uh, you did an incredible job to get through this double feature on assaults. Uh, they really are critical to your success in Epic, either performing good assaults against your opponent or being able to defend against them. And um, trust me, you'll get uh, better at defending against them as you go on as well. We're getting close to the end of our rules section um, in Epic Armageddon, but we still have a number of videos to come. The next video uh, in the series is going to look at formations breaking and regrouping during the battle, so keep an eye out for that in the next week or so. Um, I also intend to do an example video at some point around assaults, just I didn't really use too many examples in these two videos of what assaults look like um, and just perhaps some of the uh, pictorial um, you know, examples might help in assaulting, moving in, charges, making your attacks, allocating hits, breaking, all that stuff. So um, I'll look at trying to do that at some point in the future. Just might not be in the next week or two. Feel free to like or subscribe if you want to see the rest of this series. And as always, I will try and respond to any comments you might leave as well. See you next time on Too Many Games.